My name is Alex Stinson. I am one of the co-owners of Pro Ergonomics, and I will be your presenter for this month's webinar. For those of you that have been to our webinars before, thank you again for your continued support. For those of you that are new, Pro Ergonomics is a specialized ergonomics health and safety consulting firm, and we work with our clients to try and improve their ergonomic program, their hazard identification, and really get into reducing injuries and reducing risk um, in your organization. We have lots of years of experience and pride ourselves on impeccable customer service. So if you are interested in any of our services or would like to talk to us further, please contact us um, and reach out. As for today's webinar, I always have some starting issues, but here we go. Um, it's an interesting topic today. Today we're kind of taking a little bit outside of the ergonomics world and stepping into maybe one foot in the ergonomics world and one foot into the business world. So talking about cost justification and return on investment and how are we to do that? Because typically, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for lots of different reasons. So. When we start talking about how today's session is going to go, we will ask the question why, and then we'll talk about some of the return on investment challenges. I'm sure some of you are aware, but there may be some points here that kind of reiterate things that we could maybe be doing better to get us better information to make a better case for that cost justification. We will be talking briefly about some calculations. There are lots available to you. We've kind of pulled some that um, we think A, might be easy for you to use, or B, are just more maybe applicable to an ergonomics type uh, cost justification. And we'll be rounding out the session with just a couple of case studies that some of our clients have gone through, gone through and some of the just cost justification they've been able to show in really getting into controlling those ergonomic hazards and bringing down those risk ratings so that they're able to see that reduced injury rate, essentially. So the first question I have for you, and I'd like to ask you all to pick up a pencil and find a scrap of paper. It doesn't have to be a big one. It's not going to be a huge exercise. But I would like to ask you, other than injury reduction, why? Are you interested in doing kind of a return on investment or a cost justification business case at your organization? Because often injury reduction becomes the sole focus. However, we have tons of clients that will say, you know, our injury rating is pretty good or, you know, we don't even have any injuries. But it doesn't mean that a cost justification per process with an ergonomic vent wouldn't be beneficial. So. We all know injury reduction is very important and will definitely be a focus of this discussion. However, we also want to look at why else. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds, 30 seconds to write down anything you can think of, of why when it comes to ergonomics, some of the information we're going to be talking about today would be of value. Okay, so here we go. Oh, that started at 20 seconds. Do you have 20 seconds? <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so hopefully some of that maybe stirred a little bit just of a starting thought of how else you can use this because one of the first challenges that we're going to be talking about is often why our business cases for ergonomics falls flat. It is also why we kind of don't even start the process and that is because our statistics may not be what I need in order to do the return on investment equation that we're going to be talking about later. So depending on where your injury statistics are, you may not have the historical data to be able to show proof that injury reduction is going to be the primary foundation and cost justification for 
implementing whatever change it is you are looking for. We will typically see injury stats um, may not indicate the length or the duration of the injury, which really understates how complicated and how much cost was associated with that claim. So how many days, how many lost time days, how many modified days, how long did it take to return the individual to work? All of that kind of information really builds a very strong case for not just your direct costs from WSIB and medical treatment, but definitely also your indirect costs. And we'll be coming back to that point for sure. So going through how your injury statistics are laid out, asking yourself, you know, do I, do I consider the length of the duration? And am I putting in maybe as much detail as I'd like? So can I show that the manpower behind the scenes is really quite high for some of our cases or a lot of our cases, which obviously would show a higher indication that implementation of a, a control would be beneficial. We also find that because ergonomic or musculoskeletal type injuries lie very much in the realm of gray or even a muted watercolor. It is not black and white that we have trouble associating what our exact costs are for each claim. Um, that is, again, a big one. We will be talking, I will be giving you some generic information that you could use if you don't have this, you know, historically, but moving forward, trying to find a way of integrating an independent cost to each of your, your claims. What you may find is that there is a trend that claims in this part of your, um, your company or this part of your plant or, you know, department has Yes, the same number of claims, but maybe we're having a higher trend of that they're costing more, whether it be that there's more lost time, whether it be that the interventions are higher and required more attention, whatever it is. Um, it's always important if you can use your own data and if you can track the cost per claim, that gives you a very, very strong platform to then make the ask for further funds to say, we can't continue spending this kind of money. We need to start doing something. Another one that we'll often see is MSDs because of that watercolor effect, because we do not know when it happened. We do not know what exactly was being done to cause it. We don't know where. The, the questions are many and the answers are few as to how an employee started experiencing discomfort, musculoskeletal discomfort at work, and if it was work-related or not. So we'll often see MSD sometimes incorrectly documented. Uh, if you were to take an example, I have seen, you know, someone's going out to their car, it's icy and slippery, they slip, trip, and they slip, and the end result is a sprained ankle. It may not get cataloged under a slip, trip, and fall. It might get cataloged under a musculoskeletal disorder because it was a sprain or strain in their tracking record. So just depending on how you are categorizing, often when we have a sprain or strain, that category has a tendency to get inflated because we're also attributing those acute sprains and strains into that category because, and that's not wrong, it's just that you don't have another option. So looking at making sure that your chronic sprains or strains or your chronic MSDs are kind of really the capture point for making that ergonomic argument because often those acute sprains and strains the root cause isn't lying in ergonomics, it's lying in maybe a part of your other health and safety program elements. And lastly, the one we have, and I know this is kind of like a big one to tackle and often, you know, we get our near statements and we definitely use them as part and parcel, but we don't necessarily maybe have a great conversation about how we can bring that down. Specifically, if you are in a rebate statement, it's kind of like, oh, well, we're not having any issues. I can't use my near statement. But there are lots of statistics in there that you could pull that might still help benefit you and explain why you are in, in um, a rebate type situation. It could have been, you know, 
one or two claims that kind of saved the day, but you still may have had five or six that really, if it weren't for those one or two, you would have been paying. So looking at some of your near statement information and seeing how you can pull that into your cost justification is great because that is an actual, you know, document from WSIB that's going to have, you know, dollars and cents on it that's going to make people kind of sit up specifically if you are in a refund situation. So some of our solutions to overcome our challenges with statistics and how we are actually getting our injury stats and, and being able to then use those to turn them into a cost justification report or argument or case. First off, we have to start with better tracking. So when it comes to the ergonomics, we may be having a great spreadsheet or system in place for our health and safety, but often because all of those questions are easily answered, it's not a great system for ergonomics. So you may need a couple other fields that don't get used any other time than when you have a musculoskeletal disorder. So looking at trying maybe to expand out, as I said, the sprains and strains category, expand out some of the data that maybe you're collecting on, on that MSD related injury so that you're able to really show and nickel and dime some of the, the costs that are coming for that. Now, that being said, that's all in the future. That's all moving forward. We can't go back from there. So how can we maybe start today gathering data that will, you know, tomorrow allow us to go to upper management or senior management and say, there is a need here. We need to start moving on this. How can I show that? One way you may want to consider, you could also, you could look at doing a discomfort survey asking your employees, where is your discomfort? It may give you a little bit of idea of, you know, yes, our injury rates are maybe hopefully good, but if we speak to our employees, if we're listening to what they say, this is a short-lived moment in time. And down the road, based on the discomfort that we're getting and the volume of comments that we're getting that pain is a part of their lives, that's a track record we're not gonna be able to maintain. So unless we're, okay with spending the money and giving the money to make WSIB a wealthier institution, then we need to start looking at some of those ergonomic interventions so that when we do a discomfort survey in the future, hopefully there is a reduction on just that outpouring of discomfort from our, our, from our staff. The, another thing we could start looking at, and it's a little bit, you know, it may not get you the business case that you can today, but at least it stops an argument down the road. And that is ensuring that our employees and our staff are following the most biomechanical, the most safe kind of work practices they can. We will typically see when we go in, you know, we are observers at heart and we will stand there and we will observe an employee and we'll interview them and try and get a really as expert knowledge as we can from the expert themselves, the operator or the, or the staff member. And it is uncanny how often you just see poor work methods coming into play. And so it's challenging when at the end of the day, one of the biggest stop gaps we have for getting investment into our ergonomics program is employee error or human error or fault. And when we know that there is poor biomechanics happening, then we're allowing that argument to be put against us. So cleaning up kind of how are our employees working so that we're ensuring that, yes, our injuries are not coming from poor work method. They're not coming from people turning them into pretzels unnecessarily. They are coming from legitimate ergonomic risks that our organization is putting out there. So take the argument off the table. It's a good part, place to start so that you are on firmer footing going forward. The other option you could try and do, again, understanding that you may not have the statistical data to run a return on investment calculation today, but although it is a very strong case, it is not the only case that we have. And so look at other key performance indicators. What are things that we're looking for? Whether it be your absenteeism that you're tracking, whether it be waste or 
pro, sorry, productivity rates and making sure that uh, we have some of the, that data rolled in. So it may not fit again into your cost justification calculation, but it's not that they aren't firm points that we should be making in that business case that we're using. And it may be that if you need to use those in the future, that is a secondary argument that's going to help support you. So sit down, kind of go through, look at your statistics, of your injuries and how can we make them more robust on the ergonomic side or the musculoskeletal side? And secondly, build your secondary arguments. What other data is going to support me? Because often what we'll see is there is a very clear, when we're talking about you know operations of your organization, someone has that data but it's not being necessarily rolled over into the health and safety or human resources side of your organization because that's not necessarily what they feel you do. But trying to get some of those other operational information and data points integrated into your just general tracking, it will help show not only increased justification, but it'll also go forward to help show trends into where you may be having future issues. If there's constantly an area, you guys know absentee, absenteeism and turnover, which definitely fall under you know, your umbrella, are gonna be areas that put up red flags for you, but there are lots of others. And maybe it's you know as simple as employee satisfaction. Maybe it's just part of your touch points that you're doing with your employees that go into those KPIs. But figure out what they are, because at the end of the day, it's challenging when we know we need to make a big ask, and we know that the, the funding that we're going to request is definitely going to need a business case for it, but we've, we're now scrambling to try and capture that data. It is much easier if we're kind of doing it as we go. It shows not only a much longer and wider spread of data rather than let's say a month's worth. Often I'll have um, you know production data and I'll they'll be able to go back a month. Whereas if it's something that you're kind of putting into your spreadsheet, putting into your tracking, then you can make this a much stronger case on multiple, multiple levels. So our second challenge. My slides are not moving. Oh, sorry, we're not out there yet. Um, if you don't have your own statistics, then WSIB and a lot of the compensation boards out there do have some information. So, for instance, from the claims that were put through and the um, WSIB report from 2017, which is the latest one we have to work from right now, we know we had you know, 313 million paid in benefits, and of that, we had 39,000 claims. So we can average that out. We can take that information and average that per claim, we're averaging approximately $8,000. So if you know you have 18 claims costing $8,000 each when it comes to musculoskeletal disorders, then you can make a very good, strong case that there's an output of potentially unnecessary costs that are into the, the thousands. If you're looking at trying to make a specific claim, let's say you're wanting to show that you know chairs are needed in our organization. You know we have a lot of office staff. They do not have an opportunity to get up, um, move, um, or maybe they do. So therefore, you're not going to a sit stand or, or whatever your justification or argument is. But chairs is what you're looking for. Well, then we have you know from 2011, we have anywhere from 33 to 52 thousand dollars were um, average costs for back injuries. So you can start to build your case in other ways using definitely more generic data you just need to realize that there is a crack in your your case there is you've opened up the door for someone to say yeah but that's not us we're better than that and unfortunately you may have a gut instinct to say no you know we're not better than that we are we're just maybe not looking at this case right now but it's coming down the pipeline for us but that's a hard case to sell that you just have a gut instinct that no, you are 
definitely in this position. So this is one aspect that you could at least start with today if you were looking to make cost justifications, but know that there is that crack in the logic that all of a sudden we may start seeing um, people kind of just dismiss because it's not your actual picture. You're not your moment. So what we've been talking about, all those numbers that we just gave, those are direct costs. And what we'll find is there's the iceberg effect. And I know this is not new for any of you. This is definitely old imagery and an analogy. So, but we don't often, again, capture this data to show the indirect cost. And if you can, and not all of them are easily obtained either. When you look down and we see employment morale, you know, how are you going to get those, that information? How are you going to kind of put a numeric value on whether or not you have satisfied employees? But it's not any less important. Statistics and research have shown that satisfied employees typically report less unsatisfied employees report more. So if you are struggling with high claim rates, employment morale may be a component of that. So start seeing and go for the things that you can. You know, look at well, what kind of time am I, am I spending? You know, how much time am I spending in the investigation? How much time am I then spending on the communication? And this is kind of what I was trying to get at in one of the previous slides in saying that, you know, in long term term injuries, we're not necessarily building in all the man hours that it actually goes into. We just put in, and maybe we don't, depending on how uh, robust your tracking system is, but we put in, you know, oh, there it was one lost time day. We don't put in the fact that, okay, maybe there was no lost time, but there was still significant man hours. Oh, I apologize. Um, involved there to show that the investigation time, the man hours, the salary hours required for that are still very high. Um, if you are buying accommodation equipment, you know, what are those costs associating? You know, if you were looking at, well, we bought a brace or we bought a riser or a, uh, you know, platform for them to stand on, you know, whatever it is, some of those costs should be going into some of your indirect costs for your injury rates because, yes, we're having to scramble to go get those things to allow a person to return to work sooner, but we're not necessarily calculating them in the overall scope of what that injury is costing us. And then the top two, again, those are some of the harder ones that maybe it's not to say productivity, quality, and waste key point um, indicators aren't being tracked somewhere, but typically it's not necessarily fed into our HR or our HSE departments. Again, you may have the recruitment and replacement and retraining, but how, are, how robust are those numbers? So again, if you don't have those numbers, then they have been provided for you. So these are some of the typical indirect cost multipliers that you could use. So one thing that you'll see, and again, goes into that buy-in for upper management to understand that it doesn't necessarily matter whether or not it's been a lost time claim or whether it's been a claim where maybe, you know, it's, it's gone as far as it can go. And you'll see that you're, Multipliers are very representative. So what we know is that injuries are front end loaded. When you look at some of the indirect costs that we were just talking about, you know, the retraining, the replacement, the recruitment, that all happens in the front end of an injury. So we're not going to see that for our very long-term cases because those individuals, once they're hired and trained, they're gonna start getting better, so your productivity is gonna go up, not down, quality up, not down, so on and so forth. So even though you may have lots of, let's say, smaller claims, for lack of a better term, the indirect cost multiplier is 4.5. Okay, when you see that the next multiplier is 1.6, that is huge. And so we can start to show that it doesn't necessarily matter 
whether we have one, two, ten, or whether there's lots of lost time or not lost time, the indirect cost that's being spent putting into these injury claims are really a drag financially for our organization. And we could try to try and minimize those by obviously minimizing your, your injury record. So our second challenge, and again, um, although we can do something on the stat side, there's not a huge lot we can do on the time side. And that is that typically you are going to have let's say, I think most organizations that we work with, they want to see a return in either months. Maximum I've seen a return on is in, within the year. <laughs> well, um, we may not be able to say that. I would say a year is a minimum before you're going to start seeing really large returns on any ergonomic initiative that you've implemented. So there needs to be some awareness built around that. But, you know, yes, there will be a return on investment, but it's not. I'm not going to be able to do that within necessarily the first year. Typically, we'll find that it takes up to two years for even those injuries, those injuries that we have now to start showing on our premium rates. So before, you know, for those to come off and for us to stop paying for them, we're still going to be showing high injury rates on our WSIB premium rates, year statements, so on and so forth, because they have a two-year cycle on their own side. And lastly, is that even if we go and we put a fabulous ergonomic control in today, there is a really long learning curve to that. There is training that needs to be done. There is buy-in from the employees that needs to be had. There is adjustment periods to realize, okay, you know, we may have we may have over-engineered this. We may need to step back and, and try a similar approach, but something a little bit different. So there's often a bit of playtime there, whereas you know, often when we have health and safety issues, if there's a guarding issue, when we put up a guard and someone can't get their hand in, well, the return is immediate. Like the, the opportunity for having another you know, crush, pinch point, entanglement injury is not there anymore because the guard is in place and it stops those individuals and hopefully their sensors and it's done properly. But um, with ergonomic controls, it's just not the case. Sometimes I've seen, you know, lift assist come in and they're just, they, they're, they take too long. They didn't consider the cycle time that the operators have to work at. We've seen one of the very, very common ones we'll see is when we do an ergonomic report for a client, we, we are very specific, and this is maybe just a service we do, I doubt, but um, we are very specific with the equipment that we would recommend for that employee. It's usually about a very strategic reasoning of why we want that mouse or that keyboard tray. And often what we will see is we will end up being, let's say, invited back <laughs> six months down the road, and they're like, well, I don't understand. We put in the keyboard tray and we look and well we're fairly standardized on our equipment and takes all of half a second to realize no that's not the keyboard tray I recommended and the reason that they're still having issues is because we maybe had one in the office that we just thought we could implement or we went for a different one for various reasons so those extended timelines all push out when we can start seeing that employee discomfort go down, your injury rate go down, and hopefully the morale, the productivity, the quality go up to really show some of the benefits. So definitely we want to, sorry, um, again, we could go back to some of our discomfort surveys to try and show that we're getting success in maybe a softer way. It's not going to be financial up front, but that we're going to show that we're getting the input that, yes, what we're doing is beneficial. Yes, what we're doing is working. Um, we can then ensure success by, you know, training and integrating them into the processes. And again, using those key performance indicators that we created earlier to really provide a better tracking system. 
And then our final challenge is, did we do it right? Did we get the hazard, the root cause hazard, shall I say, correct? Because musculoskeletal disorders occur because of multiple MSD hazards or ergonomic hazards, you know, it's not necessarily just that repetition was the only thing that caused the injury. It was repetition, it was force, it was awkward postures, there may have been some contact stress. So your implementation, your control may not have addressed all of those. In fact, rarely do they address all of them. And it may not have addressed the right one. It may not have addressed the one that needed just a little bit stronger and causing more and more discomfort. So we definitely have some challenges with maybe we are struggling with getting our hazard identification done. Maybe we're struggling with prioritizing those hazards and understanding which ones are just hazards and which ones are really causing risk for injury. And then looking at the control implementation plan and whether or not the control is really addressing the issue up front. So, the other thing that we will see when it comes to did we do it right is the whole concept of sometimes we, we lose focus on what it is we're trying to do. We have, there's a lot of chatter in the background. We have senior management wanting, having agendas on what they want done. You have employees, you know, wanting to go things a different way. You have maybe Ministry of Labor involved. You have your ergonomist saying something. You know, you just have, there's just a lot of conversation to bring into play. And sometimes we make changes and they weren't really the change that we started with. It was something that kind of got thrown in and it's what we wanted to do. Maybe it was quicker, maybe it was faster, but it didn't necessarily make the intended goal of lowering that, improving the ergonomic function of the position. One of the er other areas would be, first off, we have really robust return to work programs and they are a great opportunity to look at what you are doing for one often is going to help benefit what you do for others. So, you know, if we've sat there, we mentioned we bought a, a platform for someone to stand on, maybe it was to lower shoulder height so their shoulder wouldn't be working above levels that were at high risk for a musculoskeletal disorder, but we only bought the one. So in our cost justification, we could say, you know, we've already had the injury, it's already happened, we've already deemed that this is the control that will help this person. There's no reason to suggest that this would not help others as well. And looking at trying to take that return to work, that accommodation piece that I know you guys are excellent at, I know you work so hard at your modified work and your return to work program, and then just pulling that out to really help others so that it's not always staying in a reactive, kind of plane. We're able to take our reactive situation and that's unfortunate that we couldn't have prevented that, but let's not make sure it happens again. Let's take those ideas and really snowball them into a more global uh, initiative to all workers. And lastly is the employee buy-in. We all know we've all bought the equipment, we've all bought the control, the you know suggested device, whatever it is. And we've rolled it out to the employees and they've used it for all of 2.5 hours and then it was put into the desk drawer, it was put underneath their workbench and they haven't used it. And that's unfortunate. And, I'm, and I can't give you a really great strategy other than communication. There needs to be communication and why you're providing it. Um, if you can, you know, depending on the I guess politics of the claim, or not if it's not a claim, that's great. If it's more of a, a proactive, there's probably less politics involved, but bringing their thoughts and their processes in and their considerations so that when that device or that control finally gets rolled out to the employee, there's not this you know, nose snubbing occurring and they actually take it and roll with it and really see value in it rather than going, I don't know why we bought this. This is just a waste of money and just dismissing it 
and not even telling you that they're just missing it. It's not until, you know, a few weeks later that you go out and you realize the antique tea matting's rolled up underneath the workbench, so on and so forth. So we need to make sure that in order to say that we are identifying the right hazards, that we have a really good, not just hazard identification program, because we all know that hazard identification is key. It's a requirement of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. However, it does create laundry lists. And not every hazard is weighted to cause injury. So also having some sort of risk assessment procedure so that you're able to try and determine what is the root cause of all these hazards, which ones do we really need to focus on for controls. Definitely, we've talked about this, I know in the webinars I've done, we've I've talked about it extensively, and I'm pretty sure Sarah and Jen are the same, is our duct tape solutions. Those things the employees are doing for themselves and really trying to make them more robust. You know, whether it's they've, quite literally duct, duct tape something up higher so they're not having to bend. Uh, we had one uh, organization where you saw we had a, a pail and they filled it with some cement and stuck a chair in the top because it helped sit. So obviously there was some safety concerns, but it gets still, it started the conversation of what is the right control? Well, that might be it because they're trying to, they're trying to work it out on their own. So try and use those duct tape solutions because that helps completely with the employee involvement and buy-in. And then as we said, really look at trying to extrapolate what you're doing for your return to work into your kind of proactive program and finding out what your KPIs and what are going to be your indicators of success. Because hopefully injury is not going to be it. Injury is not going to be your KPI for your ergonomics program because we're not going to have any because we're doing such a fabulous job. <laughs> so the other thing that we just need to kind of focus on, and this kind of goes back to we lose focus, and this has probably become some of our clients' most popular, most favorite slide, and it is just kind of being aware at each step, every time you choose a control, just asking the question, what is what am I wanting this to do? Because if you are wanting to show injury reduction, then you should be scoring a one. You should be in the green, ideally, or yellow. Let's be practical. Let's be green or yellow. And that is we are making high impact to injuries. Now, it may have a low cost, which would be fabulous. Sometimes it's going to have a high cost. But at all times, we know that we are in that upper stratosphere and we are working at high impact to reduce injuries. Now, occasionally, we're going to go to low impact on injuries and we're going to hang out in that orange zone. And those are going to be some of the uh, initiatives or controls that we know maybe aren't going to show huge returns and huge lowering of, of injuries, but maybe it is a employee want. It's a morale piece. It's a buy-in piece. It's something to show that, you know, this is an integrated system that goes both ways, and it's going to do a lot to help when you move into that upper stratosphere. What we need to make sure is that at all times, we are staying out of that red zone, that we are not just throwing money at things. Because there is nothing worse. I can't give you an equation that will undo poor judgment of a control in the past. Um, if they've given you, you know, $25,000 for the lift assist and it was over engineered to the point where it was actually increasing your injury costs, the chance of them giving you another $25,000 to redo the mistake is very, very low. Um, so as I said, there isn't an equation, there isn't a cost justification or business case for me to give you to undo poor choices. And I'm not saying you don't necessarily have choice on those choices, but if the control is to impact injuries, it just needs to be mindful. We just need to stay focused that we are staying in the green and the yellow. And if we dip down into the orange, that is fine but it is a conscious choice. 
we're not just kind of going there because politics or, you know, took us there inadvertently. So here are some of the calculators that they have. So when you take the, one of them is you take your benefits minus your cost and you divide by your cost. And that's going to give you your return on investment. Your benefit is being your productivity, your quality, your point, uh, employee engagement. So again, if you don't have these statistics, if you don't have these numbers, this is going to be a very challenging calculation to run. Um, one of the ones that, again, we find almost a little bit more applicable to ergonomic injuries is this bottom one. So you take your injury cost. So asking again the question, do you know what the injury cost was? How many injuries did you have of that kind that year? And the percentage of injury reduction. And as I said, uh, we're not going to spend a ton of time because if you go, um, Ergo Prime, who is a consulting company out of the States, has excellent content. And they have a calculator that you can download, which puts it into an Excel spreadsheet. But when you go in and you download one of these, it is going to ask you for these data points. And the reason our clients aren't moving forward with this very strong foundation and cost justification is because they just don't have those data points and they're not embedding them into their system to do them in the future. So you can kind of see where these, these pieces of information become really critical if you know you're wanting to make huge strides in your program and really kind of change what we're doing. So just to kind of summarize, there's a couple of case studies here. So we have company ABC, they're in an office environment, and 18 of their 22 workers reported discomfort. So first, we obviously, we, we made the ask. We did a discomfort survey. We made, you know, what, who is having discomfort? What discomfort are you having? So we were able to kind of gather some data here that of the 18 of 22, then we show that, you know, 33% was back. 19% was low, oh, sorry, was upper back, 19% was low back, 11% was wrist. And it just kind of goes to build the case because, I mean, at the end of the day, they decided that they needed to do ergonomic assessments for their staff, which you see the cost of the intervention down here. And then of those reports that they were provided, they then spent another you know, 11, uh, 11 and a half thousand on new office equipment. So what we were able to show is that, you know, with using the, the calculators that we have, we have five employees are having handed risks. We know that the average carpal tunnel claim cost is approximately $12,000. Well, the cost of the information in total was 17. Then we have a return on investment of 70%. With the back, similar. We had four claim costs for back are so much higher. Back becomes such a just another beast to return to work with because we're not really able to give it true rest at any given time. Um, again, you're able to show a 200% return on investment. So sit stands, workstation chairs, all of these things that we're constantly fighting with trying to get really good equipment that we know is going to make an impact on reducing our injuries. This is something that you can see. And this is, isn't using the company's data, this is just using basic injury data. So you can go there. As I said, there's just that crack in the door that says, well, this isn't what our situation looks like. One of our other companies that we had, now this one, didn't necessarily go through the full cost justification strategy. However, they did have very high injuries in 2011. And at that time, they decided that they were going to implement a risk register. And they were going to look at all of their jobs and identify the hazards and really try and put some kind of quantifier as to showing where their risk was standing. And so they found that they had almost 300 hazards that were contributing to their 39 MSD or musculoskeletal disorder injuries. And over the years, they were able to start picking those off. And they found 158 
as of 2016, were used to address and kind of mitigate some of those hazards. What they did find was that they were looking at, a, they were reduced their injuries by approximately 20 a year. So they got down in the first few years by 20. And if you were to use your $8,000 per claim, then conservatively we're looking at 160 to potentially $200,000 of cost savings for the company. And it's always great when you can say that, you know, we all have those cost saving initiatives as part of our performance review. You know, well, what are you doing to help save the company money? And, you know, sometimes we can make really great strides and say, okay, you know, we did, we renegotiated our benefits. So therefore, you know, we were able to save the company $400,000 a year for the next four years, which would be $2 million. That's fabulous. That sounds great. But we also can be using some of these things to be able to say, you know, 160000 to $200,000 annually we're saving in claims costs. That offers almost, you know, close to being this half of the $2 million that you were able to do in your benefits. So, as well, it gives you a higher percentage, not percentage, I apologize, um, gives you a higher potential expectation of what you can expect from your employees. If they are overloaded and with musculoskeletal disorders, or not disorders, hazards, we can show definitively that they can't move as fast. If they've got a task that is awkward and high force and high repetition and is really engaging all the muscles in a very negative way that functionally their body can't perform that at a rate that they could if you were just to start taking some of those hazards away. So looking at how we can do that. So in this instance, company XYZ, they knew they had their 300 hazards and they were able to almost reduce that by half. And as such, they reduced their injuries by half. They were looking at 39 and they were able to drop them by 20. So we really start to see how having the right data and having the right strategy can really start to lower your cost. So my final thought for you guys are, and it's not something that all my clients do, but the clients that do do it, I think it's just fabulous. <laughs> um, and that if you are in a position where you are getting rebates and your near statements are looking good and positive, are you reinvesting that money into the ergonomic side of your program? So if you know, let's say, you know, Right now, WSIB, we're actually on the rise again. So we were down to 42% of all claims are musculoskeletal disorder related. We're now back up to 47. So that's unfortunate, but that's the trend. So are you taking that rebated money and turning it, 47% of it back into ergonomic initiatives? Because that's a really good strategy to say, you know, you may not need to ask for that. Maybe you do. I don't know if that money comes into your, your budget or not. But if it does, then that's kind of continual one of your KPIs that you could say that we are constantly reinvesting in our program, constantly trying to make things better. So if you have any questions or, you know, you're having challenges, whether it be your statistical tracking, whether it be your hazard identification or risk assessment process, you know, please give me a call or send me an email. We are more than happy to try and help out whenever we can. We definitely, we get it. We understand that not only is it challenging to get costs to do the implementation phase, it's often challenging just to get the cost to get someone like ourselves in to do the hazard and risk assessment process if it's on a big, bigger project. So we we get your plight and if we can help at all you know we're we are there for you to support you any way we can um just like the past few months that we've been doing for those of you that aren't aware but we are doing up until june which is the uh, month of the industrial ergonomics conference but each month we do a webinar we're having a free registration so if you are interested it is a fabulous conference we've had uh, attendees say that it rivals out of partners and prevention and some of the big national conferences that we do. So 
It is very interactive, huge um, emphasis put on networking between the groups. We try and help you guys kind of maybe navigate your problems with each other and try and have internal solving of issues. And uh, yeah, there's a hot lunch, it's amazing take home packages and offers being made. So we would love to have you there. Uh, if you're interested in getting a free registration, then please, you'll see in the email that goes out with the recording link that you can just go through and um, put your name in the draw, shall we say. Or if you see the value in it, we'd love for you just to register on your own. The web, blah, 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 sorry, end of the uh, session. Webinar next month is Work Shouldn't Hurt, which is, I think, something that we all know, however, can't say that that occurs. So it's going to be a great session, and I hope you attend. Have a great day. Thank you very much for your time, and again, if we can help in any way, please let us know. Thank you.